Yeah, so thanks, Kiro, to, to giving me the opportunity to, to speak here. Um, it's always good to, to be back in Nottingham. It's nice to give a talk here. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about my current project with Catherine Weisberger uh, in Erlangen, uh, where we try to generalize uh, shear coordinates to the moduli space of uh, 2 plus 1 gravity. Uh, these shear coordinates are some, some very nice geometrical coordinates on the Teichmuller space, uh, and they encode very well um, the cer certain structure in Teichmuller space, which can be used then to, to understand quantization of the space. Uh, so we try to, well, this motivates us to, to try to generalize it to, uh, to the case of, of, of 2 plus 1 gravity, which is very much related to, to, to Teichmuller theory. Yeah, so in this talk, I'll try to, to introduce uh, Teichmuller space and the mapping class group, which are the main objects uh, in Teichmuller theory, one could say. And I'll introduce the shear coordinates for this space, describe the mapping class group action on the Teichmuller space in terms of these coordinates, and then uh, I'll define the, the moduli spaces that we'll be considering in the work. Uh, the moduli spaces of 2 plus, one, 2 plus 1 gravity, and describe how we generalize uh, these shear coordinates. Um, so, throughout the work, throughout the talk, S will be a, a Riemann surface of genus G and S punctures, uh, and satisfying uh, this inequality, which basically says that the Euler characteristic of the surface is negative, so that the surface admits hyperbolic structures, it admits a hyperbolic metric. Um, and the, the main space we'll be interested in <coughs> looking at is the Riemann, <coughs> I'm sorry, is the Riemann moduli space, which is the space of all conformal structures, or equivalently complex structures, hyperbolic structures, on, the, on this Riemann surface. And this Riemann moduli space classifies uh, the, the conformal and hyperbolic structures uh, on the surface up to diffeomorphisms, orientation preserve, pr preserving diffeomorphisms. So we consider this quotient space uh, here. Uh, okay, so it's C is the, the space of conformal structures on the surface, and H are the, the hyperbolic structures, the hyperbolic matrix on the surface. Diff S, diff plus is just orientation preserving diffuse here. Okay, and just one comment on the, on the, the number of punctures. <coughs> uh, in, in principle, we can leave the number of punctures to be zero, so consider the, the closed case uh, in the beginning of the talk, but after a while we'll need to, to have at least one puncture on the surface. Uh, we'll understand why afterwards. And in the case of, of punctured surfaces, we really need to define boundary conditions. Um, for this hyperbolic matrix. So we, we have to define how the, the hyperbolic matrix approaches the, um, the puncture. And our boundary conditions, the, the boundary conditions we'll choose, are that the lengths, the geodesic lengths of curves around the punctures are fixed and are fixed to be zero. So we consider the cusped case here. Okay, so more, more general boundary conditions can be allowed, but, uh, well, not, let's not get into that. And so why... Uh, uh, Am I interested in the Riemann moduli space? So it's inside mathematics, it, has, it appears in many different areas. Uh, it appears in the study of geometric structures, complex analysis, uh, group theory, also algebraic structures and dynamical systems, and it serves as a meeting point uh, of all these this theories. So it's, it's a very uh, important uh, space uh, inside mathematics. In physical terms, it's also related to the phase space of certain interesting physical theories, such as 2 plus 1 gravity and Church Simons theory. And that's why we, we, we want to look at these guys. But as a space itself, uh, it uh, carries a lot of structures. Uh, that, uh, that, that's true, yes, that's right. Maybe I am a bit biased, uh, and unfortunately I leave some, some, some things out because of lack of knowledge, and uh, so this is my own personal view of why these guys are, yeah. 
Uh, so it, it presents many different structures, uh, including different matrix structures, different compactifications with respect to this matrix, also a very natural complex structure, and interesting for the talk at hand, uh, the post, uh, a Poisson structure, symplectic structure as well. But on the other hand, it's a very complicated space. It, it, it has a very complicated topology. Yeah, so the, the, the fundamental group of this the surface is very, very uh, intricate, and it also presents certain singularities. Therefore, it's better to look at the universal covering space and the action of the uh, fundamental group as deck transformations uh, separately. And that's where Teichmuller space comes in play. So Teichmuller space is the universal covering space of the Riemann moduli space. And it's defined as the space of conformal or hyper hyperbolic structures on the surface up to small diffeomorphisms, up to diffeomorphisms that can be deformed uh, uh, smoothly to the identity or generated by, by vector fields, let, let's say like that. Yeah, so uh, we consider this a Teichmuller space. And then the fundamental group of, of the Riemann moduli space, the so-called mapping class group, it's the um, group of diffeomorphism classes or isotopy classes of diffeomorphism. So it's the connected component uh, of the diffeomorphism group. Right? So it's, it's quite a non-trivial guy. And now if we, we consider Teichmuller space, it still has the same amount of structure as the Riemann moduli space. So you can just pull back uh, from the projection map and you have all the structure that I spoke about before. Uh, but now it's, it's, it's very simple. It's just some open uh, ball, an, an open cell of this dimension. So it's 6G minus 6 plus 2S dimensions. Of course, this dimension here depends very much on the choice of boundary conditions uh, around the punctures. Yeah, so this is for uh, our choice. Okay, so we want to, as I said, we want to, to describe, what have I done? Uh, maybe I could. Yeah, okay. So we want to describe the, the, the Poisson structure on the, on the Riemann moduli space, but now on the Teichmuller space. And to define this, uh, one way to define this is by connecting Teichmuller space to the theory of flat connections uh, on the surface. So Teichmuller space is very uh, much related to the space of flat PSL to R connections on, on on the surface, and this comes about uh, via the uniformization theorem. The uniformization theorem basically states that uh, a hyperbolic matrix, or class of hyperbolic matrix, is in one-to-one -one correspondent, co correspondence with certain class of representations of the fundamental group of the surface on, the, on PSL2R. Right? So basically all hyperbolic structures comes from the hyperbolic structure on the unit disk, uh, modulo some discrete group of isometries, uh, which is isomorphic to, to the fundamental group of the surface. And PSL to R, uh, yeah, so PSL to R is the group of isometries of, of, uh, of the unit disk. I don't want to explain where, where it comes P, but it's just. Right, yes. So, so, so basically, uh, the, the, the SL2R group defines a Möbius transformation as, as some, sorry, sorry, right? So, uh, PSL2R group, D, that x equals to 1, right? It determines a Möbius transformation, uh, z plus b, cz plus d. Uh, and this Mabius transformation is clearly uh, invariant if we multiply this matrix by plus or minus one. And that's why uh, we have this. Uh, okay, so the, the uniformization theorem relates Teichmuller space to the space of flat connections, but of course, it's not true that all representations, all flat connections, appear in such a way. So, uh, so Connection is, is given in terms of the holonomy representation. So if you have a, a connection, it is completely determined by its holonomy representation. And basically, this is the representation that appears here. Because I want to, I want to define the, the Poisson structure via the, the, the Atiyabot Poisson structure in the space of connection. Right. Right. In the next slide, 
I'll, I'll use it. Maybe, yeah. maybe another way of saying this theorem is that any metric can be uh, transformed into a constant curvature metric. Right, but uh, this, this is already constant curvature, uh, actually. So I'm already taking hyperbolic metrics here. Yeah, so. Right, so, so, right, so, so, we, we are already talking about the hyperbolic metric. Uh, is using the second metric yes. Space, yes. Well, okay. So, I just want to say that the fact that the metric, the hyperbolic metric age is non-degenerate uh, implies that the representations that appear or the connections that appear, they are all only the so-called Fuchsian uh, representations, the Fuchsian connections, so, which means that the representation that if this representation is discrete and faithful. Um, so it's a special class of, of representations, and therefore Teichmuller space sits inside this, this space of homomorph, uh, homomorphisms, uh, modular conjugations, as some, some subspace. And in fact, this subspace is, uh, is a connected component of, of the representation variety. Okay, for reasons I'm going to discuss. And in the representation variety, or in the space of flat connections, uh, we know, uh, uh, we physicists know. Uh, again, the, the, we can parameterize the flat connections in terms of their holonomy representations. So if you have a holonomy representation, you can obtain a flat connection. Right. No, there is a trivial flat, flat connection there. Right. So it's trivial in the sense. Right. Yeah. This is, so I don't want to get into too much details because there, there are other things to, 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 to talk about. But yes, uh, I just want to, to mention flat connections because I imagine that people are more uh, accustomed to them than to to hyperbolic metrics uh, due to the connection with Shannon Simon's theory. So j that's that's all. But but again, here on the space of, of, of flat connections or on the space of representations. Uh, on this representation variety of the fundamental group of the surface into PSL2R, we have a natural symplectic structure that comes from the space of all connections, and is given by this formula here that probably people already saw. Uh, uh, and this is the, the atia uh symplectic structure, and it reduces to the space of flat connections and then restricts to the Teichmuller component of the, of the representation variety. And equivalently, in terms uh, of representations only we can describe the symplectic structure in terms of the Goldman bracket, uh, which is well given by this this rather complicated expression, but which has a very simple interpretation in terms of intersection of, of curves. Um, but maybe I don't have time to, to, to go much into this. It's just worth to say that uh, although there is a nice interpretation and, and you can really use this to some extent, this, this symplectic structure to, to some extent. Uh, it also becomes very complicated when you start considering uh, closed curves that are very wild. Uh, they go around your surface a lot. It starts becoming hard to, to, to deal with it. So what we want to do is to understand some coordinate system on Teichmuller space where this Poisson structure becomes uh, more uh, manageable. Yeah, and this is where we, why we... we in Sorry, the, the, the what? This, these guys are, 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 um, are just connections. So they are just one forms with values in the Lie algebra. In, the, in this case, PSL2R. So, sorry. Well, I don't understand the, the question. So I'm thinking that we have some some 
trivial flat, uh, uh, trivial bundle, trivial PSL2R bundle over the surface, and we have some flat connection, and I'm parameterizing these connections as some one forms with values in the Lie algebra of of the of this group. They are not. The, I would say that if if G if the group was R, then yes. But these are generalizations of that. Uh, in the, Maybe we can discuss this after. We have the loop of isometries of the unities. And every isometry of the unities. Well, as I said, there is a natural flat connection of the unities. And every isometry we can associate with the group element, which is a self driving element generating the isometry. And at the same time, it's just the one organ of the connection along the class. Okay. So to to come back to the to the problem at hand of describing coordinates on this on this on this space, uh, we need to introduce some structure uh, on the surface. Um, and this structure, and, and here is where we need to, to, to choose uh, to, to make S bigger than zero, to, make, uh, uh, to at least have one puncture on the surface, because we want to introduce ideal triangulations uh, on, this, on this surface. And ideal triangulations are just triangulations uh, whose vertices are exactly at the puncture. Right? And uh, this is a, a quite restrictive uh, thing for a triangulation, because the asking for, for the vertices to be at the punctures uh, introduces another restriction, another relation, or another equation uh, between the edges, faces, and vertices of, of, of the triangulation. And this completely determines, therefore, the, the number uh, of vertices, edges, and, and faces of the triangulation given the topology of the, of the surface. And this is nice uh, after a while because we'll be comparing certain triangulations and it's better to have less possibilities, uh, uh, and so on. So this is an example for, for uh, ideal triangulation of the puncture torus. Uh, and we also need um, the, the dual graph to, this, to a triangulation, which is just the graph obtained by associating to each face of the triangulation some vertex, to each edge, another edge that crosses it uh, at one single, po single point, and to each vertex of the triangulation, we have a face of the graph. And the face of the graph is not something that is defined uh, naturally, but because these are embedded graphs, uh, they have some orientation. They, they are embedded in some surface. They have an ordering of the adjacent vertices at uh, adjacent edges to each vertex. And you can define the face of the, of the graph by just following a path along the graph uh, that turn to the same side at each vertex, turn to the same, uh, to the next uh, edge when they uh, arrive at each vertex. Yeah, so this is the dual graph to this triangulation in the universal covering. Why is it green like that? Because this is a triangulation, so you need triangles. So, yes. So this is not just, just a picture of the, 
of the universal covering of or the fundamental region of this surface, but really of the triangulation as well. Um, right, so if we have now a, uh, an ideal triangulation on our surface, we can define coordinates for each hyperbolic metric uh, on this surface uh, as follows. Yeah, so for each edge of the, of the triangulation, we associate a number to this edge uh, via this formula here, where this t uh, has a very geometrical interpretation. So each edge alpha, uh, it separates two triangles, Therefore, it defines a, an ideal quadrilateral, so a, a, a square with points at infinity. And these objects are completely defined up to isometries by a single number, which is a cross ratio between the, the four points. So basically, with some isometry, so, uh, with a PSL2R element, you can always map three points uh, on the surface, uh, three points on the disk, uh, to to pr three prescribed points. So we take our triangulate uh, our ideal square and map or normalize the, the the square so that the upper triangle is at this canonical uh, position. Then the other the, the, the other vertex of the of the square will lie at some point on the on the circle and this defines the 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 cross ratio. And uh, maybe an easier way to see this is to look at the, at the upper half plane model where we map this upper triangle here to this uh, ideal triangle which has vertex at minus one, zero and infinity. And the other uh, triangle, the lower triangle will be mapped in some, some arbitrary position here and T is exactly the, the coordinate of this vertex. Yeah, and these guys are called shear coordinates because you can also interpret this coordinate in, in, in the following way. You project perpendiculars from the edge, uh, from the vertices opposing, opposite to the edge alpha. You just drop perpendiculars here. And then this log of t, or this, this, this shear coordinate, is exactly the hyperbolic distance between these two points. So it, it's measuring the shearing between uh, the two triangles. In no. This is true for you. So this is true for any any triangulation. You have ideal triangulations. This is just a picture of one one tr pair of triangles in in a general triangulation on, on any surface. To rephrase it, the idea is to glue a surface out of ideal triangles. If you have at least one point sure, then you can triangulate the surface so that every triangle is a ideal triangle as vertices and punctures. And then you glue the surface by gluing these ideal triangles, and this parameter tells you how you glue them. Right. So, so in not only this, uh, these coordinates have this very geometrical definition, they also encode uh, the, the geometry of, of the metric that they are, they are representing, so the, the geometry of age, which they parameterize in a very nice way. So they, they encode this uh, via encoding the holonomy, so we can reconstruct the holonomies of, of this metric uh, by using the, the dual graph to the triangulation. So here's a picture of the dual graph, again, in the, in the one's puncture torus here. And so to, to reconstruct the, um, the holonomies, we basically start with a, a, an element of the fundamental group of the surface and decompose this element into a sequence of edge paths uh, on, the, on the dual graph. So for example, here in the, in the puncture torus, you see that this cycle this blue-green cycle here is exactly decomposed as a blue-green edge path uh, in, inside the, the graph, right? And then we have a prescription for how to, to obtain the holonomy out of the coordinates uh, on, the, on the dual graph. So basically, uh, for each edge, we associate some matrix parameterized like this via the, um, in, in, the, in the coordinates. And then multiply it by either a left turning or right turning matrix, depending on whether your path turns right or left uh, going to the next edge. So for example, for this blue green cycle here, uh, we start at the blue line, then we turn left to the green line, and then we return turning right to the blue line. So the holonomy that we have 
given coordinates in this graph is this. So x, x alpha, L, x, x beta, R. So we can reconstruct the holonomies uh, out of the coordinates uh, well in a very computational way. Yeah, so this is very nice property of these coordinates, which I think uh, are better than, than other coordinates that, that are around, as far as I know, at least. OK, so what, what happens then is that we have a parameterization of Teichmuller space of any point, any hyperbolic metric. Uh, in terms of uh, E real numbers, where E is the number of edges of the ideal triangulation. But of course, since we uh, introduce boundary conditions at the punctures, uh, the, the holonomies around the punctures cannot be, uh, cannot be arbitrary. So the fact that we fix the lengths, the geodesic lengths around the punctures to be zero, imposes that the holonomies are parabolic elements of PSL2R. And this means that for each of the, of the punctures, we'll have a constraint. So we get S constraints uh, satisfied by this coordinate. So this, this might be a problem, because this constraint might be very complicate, complicated, but they, they're actually not. So when they are not, because uh, again, the, the, the path that goes around the punctures, uh, they, are, they are the faces of the, of the graph, and they are obtained by only turning left or only turning right at each vertex. So it becomes very easy to compute uh, the, the parabolic condition on the, on, the, on the holonomies, and it turns out to be just a linear relation uh, for the coordinates x. So basically, the sum over uh, coordinates along the, uh, along the puncture, around the puncture, yeah, sum with multiplicities, of course, has to be 0. So basically, the sum, sum over coordinates around the edges of, of, of the face gives the length of the geodesic around the, the puncture. Yeah, so what happens is that since these coordinates are linear, these shear coordinates uh, basically turn Teichmuller space into a linear subspace of RE. Again, E is the number of edges of the, of the graph or the, or the ideal triangulation. So this, this is quite nice. Um, but better yet, uh, we can describe the Poisson structure on the on Teichmuller space in terms of these coordinates in a very simple way. So we can define on, on RE this, the following bivector, which only depends uh, on the neighboring edges. So for each, um, for each edge alpha, the contributions for the Poisson structure for the Poisson bracket with alpha is just given by the neighboring edges. So it's only non-zero for the neighboring edges. And this, the combinatorial structure of this, of, this, uh, of this Poisson structure implies quite easily, it's very easy computation to do, that these constraints are Casimir for, for this Poisson structure. So the, the constraints commute with any function on, on RE. So for any function, uh, the constraints commute. So the Teichmuller space not only is a linear subspace of RE, but is actually a, a Poisson subspace of this Poisson vector space here, right? Because it's a vector space, and it's Poisson. It's constant. Here, yes. And in fact, when you look at the tangent, at the tangent level, since this is a linear space, the tangent becomes identified with the space itself. So it, it really becomes a Poisson vector space. So it, it simplifies quite a lot your life. So when, and, and actually, this, this makes uh, the problem of quantization quite, uh, well, you can, you can attack the problem of quantization quite neatly in this, in this way, just by, by looking at the, the quantization of this and then restricting to, the, to this Poisson submanifold, which is very easy, and people have done that. Um, but of course, things are not um, that simple. You also have now the, the mapping class group action. And when you quantize, you will, you would, want that the mapping class group acts on the, on the, on the, quanti on, on the quantum Hilbert space as some unitary operation. So we, we, we still have to understand the mapping class group action uh, in, in terms of these coordinates to be able to, to continue with the, to, well, at least with the deformation quantization uh, recipe for, for finding a quantum theory. So by deformation quantization, you find some, some algebra of functions uh, whose commutator 
uh, is given by classically as a limit by the, the Poisson bracket. Uh, and you find some Hilbert space where this, where this algebra acts as, as, as operators. Not at this, not for me, not at this point. Yeah, so I guess this, this would be, uh, it's probably something that people are looking at right now as understanding the quantization because this quantization is more or less understood, but understanding a path integral uh, description, I'm not sure how, how much developed it is. Uh, but but I, I don't know. Right, so we have to look at the mapping class group action. And so the mapping class group acts on, so remember that the mapping class group was the classes of diffeomorphisms up to small diffeomorphisms. Uh, and they act naturally on Teichmuller space via pullback. So they just pull back the metric uh, there. And this action is actually very nice to some extent. Right? It's properly discontinuous. So, so the quotient space is Hausdorff. But it's not free, so this is where some singularities appear in the Riemann moduli space. And as I said before, the, the, the Riemann moduli space is the quotient or bifold uh, of, this, of, this, uh, of this action. Right? And just to have some intuition, I wrote this uh, picture just to have some intuition of, of this action of the mapping class group um, uh, in terms of Dan twist. So the mapping class group can be seen as generated by these Dan twists, which are operations where you cut your surface along uh, closed curves, twist it, and then glue it back together. And you can see the, the effect of such Dan twist on this red curve. So it's a Dan twist along the blue curve acting on the surface. Uh, and it deforms this, this red curve into some curve like this that goes around the handle now uh, one more time. Okay, so just to have a picture in mind. Um, and okay, so now, now that we, want, we have shear coordinates, we would like to, to understand the mapping class group action in these coordinates. And we basically want to compute uh, this type of uh, matrix elements. Uh, so how, how to, to, to be able to describe um, this map, mapping class group element. And this is the same as finding uh, the expression for the shear coordinates of the pullback of a hyperbolic metric as a function of the shear coordinates of the hyperbolic metric itself. Right, so this is uh, just what this, this, this means. Uh, so to simplify this, this, this problem, we can actually look at another graph um, and, and, and make a, a similar, solve a similar problem so but, but by looking at another graph. So you look at the image of the graph under the mapping class group action. So we, we just look at the image of this guy. So this, this defines another embedding of the, of the same combinatorial graph on the surface. And of course, the, the coordinates defined by this, this, this new graph should not be the same as the coordinates defined by the previous graph right, for, for the same hyperbolic metric. But if we compare the coordinates of the hyperbolic metric, the, 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 the hyperbolic metric that we started with, with the graph defined by the image of the, the, of the graph gamma, uh, and then compare the pullback 
the coordinates of the pullback of the metric with the original graph, then we see that the result has to be the same. J just because we are pulling back this metric and we are pulling back this graph now. So here it's clear that the, that the metric should, that the coordinates should be the same. And of course this is a mistake, so there should be no, no prime here. Um, which the, 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 the statement here is that the um, x alpha not, not primed of the pullback hyperbolic matrix is the same as the help x alpha prime of the hyperbolic matrix, right? So the, the problem now, instead of finding these coordinates in terms of this, becomes of finding coordinates for the same hyperbolic matrix but for different graphs. And this, this is actually much simpler to, to deal with, okay? And this is simpler because uh, two embeddings of the, of the same combinatorial graph are known to be related by certain moves along the graph. So this, this is the same as in terms of the ideal triangulation is to say that any triangulations can be related by patchner moves. Um, so there, there are two types of patchner moves, the 2 to 2, two, two, two patchner moves and the 3 to 1 patchner moves, but here we only have 2 to 2 since we are using ideal triangulations. Right? So we are not allowed to introduce new vertices on the surface. So now we can find the, the we can find the expression for the mapping class group action in coordinates by just looking at these generators of the mapping class group, which are the white head moves for, uh, for embeddings of the graph. Oh, it's in the next slide. So I'll draw it. Right, so a, a white head move along an edge alpha is basically this operation of collapsing the edge uh, to a point and then expanding it again in the opposite direction. Uh, and so this, this guys, this, the claim of the le ne last slide was that these guys generate the, the mapping class group up to certain relations that, um, that they have to satisfy. Basically, well, yeah. So there's some, some relations that need to be satisfied so that we have really um, a representation of the mapping class group. So, but now if we look, if we do the computations for, uh, for the same hyperbolic metric on, on, for the same hyperbolic metric, we compare the coordinates obtained uh, with this embedded graph and with that one, now this is very easy to compute. Now you can really do the computation explicitly and you can find the relation between the coordinates um, the primed coordinates and the non-primed coordinates. So you basically find the expression of the, the mapping class group action uh, by, by, by doing this, right? And of course, uh, the, the other edges, the ed the, there are more edges, uh, they, they are simply un un unaltered, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I probably don't go to, to 2 plus 1 gravity, or maybe. Let's, let's, let's see. Um, okay, so right, so we have an expression for the mapping class group action, and it's easy now to, com to, to study the, the, well, the behavior of the constraints and of the Poisson structure that we defined before in coordinates uh, in terms of these coordinate transformations. And it's easy to see that this white hat moves, and therefore the mapping class group preserves uh, these structures and preserve the, the, the constraints as well. So they, they descend to the constraint surface, to the Teichmuller space, and they also preserve the structure there so that all of these still descend to, to the uh, Riemann moduli space. Uh, okay, so, so this, this gives a, ni a nice picture, at least for me, uh, uh, of the, the shear coordinates on Teichmuller space um, and why we would like to, to, to have them. Yeah, so maybe I, this motivates uh, us to look at the same construction, if the same construction is possible uh, on the moduli spaces of um, two plus one dimensional space times that satisfies Einstein equations. Uh, and I'll try to say a few things about it, uh, why they are related to, to Teichmuller theory. No. So now we consider uh, three manifolds which are products of a surface such as the one that we were considering up until now, and time, right? And 
so th this, are, this is the topological setting. And the very nice simplification uh, that happens in three dimensions is that for any metric uh, in three dimensions, the vial, uh, the vial curvature vanishes identically. And therefore, the Riemann tensor is proportional. It's completely determined by the Ricci tensor. Further, Einstein equation then implies, so Einstein equation says that Ricci is proportional to, 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 curve, to, to the metric. And this in, implies that the, the, you know, any Einstein manifold in three dimensions has sectional curvature equal to the cosmological constant. And therefore, all of these guys are locally isometric to given model space times. Yeah, so either Minkowski space in three dimensions, ADS space in three dimensions, or the Sitter space in three dimensions, depending on the value of, of lambda. Is it now a classical yes, it's a classical statement, yes. I don't know, I, I don't understand the quantization of, of this theory, so. Right, and we also uh, impose that the space times that we consider here are globally hyperbolic, uh, so so that we can uh, state um, the the Einstein equations as an initial value problem in some given Cauchy surface, and so the maximal condition is just saying that uh, this is the the biggest one we can find. We cannot embed this guy in a bigger space time, so it's just some some technical statement. But then with, with this additional uh, requirement, there, there are some very nice classification results, classical classification results that uh, we can use. And basically what we can do in the in the in the in this globally hyperbolic case is to consider the ADM formulation uh, of gravity. So we, we really look at, at uh, the Einstein Hilbert action uh, in a second order way, so we choose some time direction, and the initial data n that describes the solutions are then shown to be uh, parameterized by the cotangent bundle over the space of conformal structures. Basically, the first fundamental form is locally uh, given by some conformally flat metric, and the second fundamental form is completely defined by some, uh, some quadratic differential like this. And the gauss kodasi equations that, that tells you that this is a surface sitting in an I, in a Einstein manifold, uh, in a bigger three-dimensional manifold. So gauss kodasi equation then just tells you that this quadratic differential is holomorphic and that, well, you, you solve the, the conformal factor. You find the conformal factor uniquely. So the data that parameterizes this is a conformal structure, so this, this Z coordinate in some sense, and a quadratic holomorphic differential, which is a cotangent direction in this space. Yes, I am in the maximal surface, yeah. So, so here, to, to, ex to state this correctly, I have to choose the Cauchy surface maybe carefully. Yeah, but, but you can always choose in such a way that, that it works like that. Yes, 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 yes. So, so this is what, yeah. So therefore, the moduli spaces that we are interested in, this, this, the space of globally hyperbolic constant curvature Lorentzian structures, uh, they are basically parameterized by Teichmuller space. Yeah, so of course there is the action of the mapping class group again. Uh, and, but, but this is the space that we want to... So since there is this, this connection with Teichmuller theory, we would like to know if we can develop the same coordinates or sh similar coordinates um, uh, in this context. Right? But one thing that I want to note here that is quite important uh, is that the, the identification of this Moduli, this moduli space with the cotangent bundle over Teichmuller space depends very much on lambda. And so this is important to, to notice. And so it depends on the value of the cosmological constant. And this means that this action of the mapping class group here is different for different values of the cosmological constant. And this is, so they are not exactly the same space. Yeah, the, mod, the moduli spaces are not exactly the same space, at least classically. I don't know. Okay. So, the classification results for, for, for these moduli spaces can also, uh, are also developed by these guys. Um, and they are pretty much some generalization of the uniformization theorem. They basically say that the uh, globally hyperbolic, uh, maximal globally hyperbolic space-time metric is in one-to-one -one correspondence to certain holonomy representations 
uh, of the fundamental group of the space-time, but this is the same as the fundamental group of the surface, uh, into an appropriate isometry group. So the, uh, the isometry group of the model space-time, which, well, here it is. Yeah, and of course, the same thing happens here. Uh, so not all uh, representations arise here because of the de non-degeneracy of the metric. Yeah, so what the non-degeneracy of the metric implies is that only certain representations, and, well, they are shown to be certain deformations, certain special deformations of Fuchsian representations. I'll try to, to, to explain this a little bit if I have time. Um, so, the, also this Teichmuller-like moduli space, so the, the universal covering of the moduli spaces that we defined before, they again sit on, on the representation variety or the space of flat connections uh, with respect to, to the appropriate gauge group. Yeah, so there are some, some component there. And the Poisson structure, the gravitational Poisson structure is also related to the Atiyabot or the Goldman bracket Poisson structure in the in this moduli space. Okay, so to, I want to, de to describe a little bit this, this deformation, but perhaps this is a bit uh, complicated, but I'll try to go fast uh, through it. But this is, these deformations are defined via the process of grafting. Uh, um, so the, this deformations of Fuchsian representations that define the, the general holonomy of, of a space-time. Yeah, so we can we start with a Fuchsian holonomy with, with a hyperbolic surface, if you if you want, uh, and we deform it in a certain way inside a, a bigger space. Yeah, so basically there is a natural embedding of this PSL two R of, of of the PSL two R group into all of the isometric groups uh, that we are considering. So here, obviously, PSL two R goes into the uh, first factor. Here it go it embeds diagonally here uh, just as a real part of, of uh, a real section of the, the PSL2C group, right? And this, this embedding of, of the PSL2R group corresponds to embedding uh, the unit disk in some sense, embedding the unit disk inside Minkowski space, uh, ADS space, or uh, the Sitter space as some, some totally geodesic uh, Cauchy surface or, or space-like surface. Yeah, so this picture here corresponds maybe to the ADS case. And so if we look at the, at, or we, if we start at, with some Fuchsian representations, some, some hyperbolic surface, and we pick a cotangent direction, we can define a new, um, a new, deform a new representation yeah, by defining some object called a co-cycle. Or equivalent co cycle, which is defined um, in terms of this uh, this cotangent direction. Basically, the cotangent direction can be seen as a certain set of curves, weighted curves inside the surface. This is called a measured geodesic lamination. So maybe this picture is the one to have in mind, where the cotangent direction corresponds to just a simple closed curve with some weight. Um, and out of this, we can define this 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 co cycle, which is an object that takes two points in the universal cover and defines a group element. And, it, and it's defined like that. So we take two points, x and y, on the universal cover, so on the unit disk. And we look at the geodesic going through this, this well, joining these two points. So for each intersection point, p, uh, of this geodesic with the lift of the, the, the simple curve here, we associate certain, certain group element. Yeah, and we associate this group element, uh, which is generated. Uh, this is a bit complicated, but this this so this is the explanation. This is the exponential of some Lie algebra element, and this Lie algebra element is the generator of rotations around this curve inside ADS space. So basically, we are thinking that we are in ADS space here. This is a totally geodesic plane. If we have a geodesic on this plane, then there is a generator, there is an SL2R transformation that uh, rotates this plane along this, this curve. Yeah, and so this is the generator that sits here. So this is how we construct this co-cycle, and out of this co-cycle, well, it satisfies certain nice properties, so that 
this formula here defines a new representation. Yeah, so basically now we take a, a, we take a closed curve on the surface, we look at the Fuchsian holonomy, and then we multiply it by the co-cycle, taking into account all the intersection points of its lift with the measured lamination. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm... Yes, we are just multiplying this, this for each, for each uh, element, so for each um, group element corresponding to an element of the fundamental group, we just multiply it by some different matrix, which is uh, given in terms of this co-cycle. So we're just multiplying each element by some different way. Right. Right, right. That, that's why you take the product here over all intersection points. Right, and also uh, look at the cost cycle. You just take a lift of the curve. I mean, this defines some some segment inside the the the, the disk, and you just consider the, the the points, the intersection points along this segment. And this 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 works. All right. Yes, yes, yes. It does matter. So, of course, you, you ha you, perhaps there is some orientation here to, to, to be taken. This, this product is not really arbitrary, but you, you have to take them in the order that they, they, they happen. Uh, perhaps this is the... Mm. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, right, so right, uh, I understand. I'm, I'm not so sure, I'm not sure. Yeah, I cannot say, I know. I, I, but I, I, th I think this is the, the right expression, though. But we can see. I'm, I'm, I'm not completely sure on that. Right, so now, I don't know how much time I have, actually. Okay, so I mean, I can try to go very fast on this. But now we, we try to understand uh, how to parameterize this holonomy representation, the deformed holonomy representations in some generalized way in terms of coordinates along dual graphs on the, on the surface, right? And it's very easy to, to, to define uh, shear coordinates or generalizations of the shear coordinates on the cotangent bundle over Teichmuller space. Now that we have Teichmuller space as some... Um, and that uh, the linear subspace of RE, uh, its cotangent bundle is also a linear subspace of its, uh, the cotangent bundle over RE, and there is some natural identification there, up to some gauge fixing, perhaps. Yeah. So we just basically we just pull back the the one for the coordinate one forms in RE to the surface via the embedding map, and we get, um, yeah, we get these coordinates like that. Uh, so I, I don't want to, 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 I don't know if I should explain this more. So basically, the, the only thing is that since we have constraints satisfied by the, the coordinates alpha, the, the, the identification of uh, the, let's say, the coordinate one forms in RE with the coordinate one forms in Teichmuller space, this is not canonical. And you can always add um, a, dif a differential of the constraints Basically, so in other words, you you have gauge transformations because you have constraints on X, so you have to gauge fix and. But it's not so hard to gauge fix. You can gauge fix uh, using the same type of of constraints that you used before. So that's not. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And then uh, this is the claim of of. of or the, the main claim of, of the work we, we've been doing is that this, this uh, deformed representations can be described uh, in, in the shear coordinates via some type of complex translation of the coordinates. So basically, we, we just need to consider uh, not now only real coordinates, but also uh, some complex 
uh, term here. But this is not quite a complex uh, 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 coordinate because this L here is supposed to uh, square to minus lambda. So it's, it's really uh, an imaginary number when lambda is equal to 1, but this is something else, some other algebraic object when uh, lambda is 0 or lambda is 1. But basically what it's telling us is how we should deform the, this PSL2R uh, subgroup of the, of the isometry group of these space times uh, in different directions. It's, it's, it's really what it's saying here. Yeah, and, and it's given like that. So basically, if we have um, a, 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 an element of the fundamental group of the surface, we look at the cyclic edge path along the, along the dual graph, as, as we did before. And the corresponding deformed holonomy is given again by this product of matrices, where this, this now generalized matrices involving two uh, coordinates are basically the old matrices, but just with this complexified coordinates. Yeah, and this works basically because the space of cocycles that we use to define these deformations can be parameterized uh, in terms of closed curves on the surface, so by this, this, this construction that, that I mentioned, more or less, but also in terms of the um, ideal geodesics, ideal edges of the triangulation. You might as well put coordinates there, and this is basically what we are doing. This Y coordinates are coordinates parameterizing these cocycles, really. Yeah, that uh, I'm not going to extend so much more. But to, to summarize, what we are doing here is to each globally hyperbolic metric and some ideal triangulation on the surface, we can associate generalized shear coordinates for this for this metric along edges of the ideal triangulation or its dual graph via this expression. So basically we have the coordinate for the corresponding Fuchsian representation plus some, some term here uh, corresponding to, to this deformation. And this term is defined through the coordinates in the cotangent bundle yeah, via this expression here. So we, used, we use here the, the Weil-Peterson or the, the, the Goldman-Poisson structure on PSL to R to define this. So P, P, P is the core. Yes, P is canonically conjugate to X, and, and is it's just this. It's just this combination. Yeah. So from so X satisfies certain uh, constraints. Y is now defined via this uh, expression using uh, certain th this this. Uh, matrix elements, which are defined uh, from the Poisson bivector. And this implies that the same uh, constraints are satisfied by the Z uh, coordinate. And they are exactly the same constraints as, as previously, but now they are complexified. Now they, are, they have this complex term. But you don't need to gauge fixed P because of this, because of this matrix. So here, here it doesn't matter. Here it doesn't matter. So basically, this gives generalized shear coordinates on the, spa on the moduli space of 2 plus 1 gravity as some linear subspace of Re times Re. And just finally, the expression for the, for the symplectic structure, the Poisson structure on the, in terms of these coordinates, is again exactly the same as, as the previous one, but now complexified, complexified in quotes. And of course, because you want a real uh, symplectic structure, you have to take or real or imaginary part, and here it turns out that you have to take the imaginary part of. Well, is, is the same is the same thing, right? So if you have uh, x plus l y, well, you have some some uh, involution, which x minus l y, and real and imaginary part is just some and different of these guys. Is divided by l, or yeah, is the same is the same thing? Yeah, so. With this expression for the, for the symplectic structure, just by the same combinatorics as before, the constraints satisfied by, satisfied by the z-coordinates are Casimir constraints. Uh, so, so we actually have uh, a, uh, the, the moduli space of 2 plus 1 gravity as some sub-manifold, uh, some, some Poisson subspace of, of this real vector space again. 
Yeah? And just, just a final remark, uh, we can also consider the mapping class group action on these spaces, and we find similar formulas for the uh, whitehead moves, which also preserve the constraints in the Poisson structure. We can also consider the pullback of the Poisson structure, or the pullback of the symplectic structure to the cotangent bundle over the Schmuller space via the, the identification, and it turns out that all, of, all three symplectic structures are the same, are the co canonical cotangent bundle, symplectic structure for all values of lambda. Uh, and this is, this is also related to some work that I'm doing with Jean-Marc Schlenke uh, with weak rotations uh, in this context of, of 3D gravity, and which gives a very nice complex analytical interpretation of this, of this fact. Uh, right. So this is a Poisson structure on R2E, Right, and this, the constraints that define the moduli space as a subspace of R2E are Casimir. So you have a Poisson submanifold sub, subspace of R2E. There, you have three, depending on L. So there are three different uh, Poisson structures here. So we have three moduli spaces. This, you can also pu you can pull back now this um, this uh, structure to the cotangent bundle over Re with its canonical cotangent simplet. This is space, uh, two axes, right? You have a right. Yes. 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 Okay. So, can I just come back a little bit more? So, so basically, here we find a coordinatization of, Teich, of cotangent bundle over Teich-Muller space. Uh, as, as a, a linear subspace of cotangent bundle over Re, and this guy has also a canonical cotangent bundle symplectic structure, right? And via this, this map here, yeah, via this map here, we can pull back, or we can compare this, this, this three symplectic structures with the canonical cotangent bundle symplectic structure, and they are the same. Yeah. And th there is a very nice complex analytical interpretation of this, that, that, that is work that I'm doing with Jean-Marc Schlenker. Right, and I just want to, to again state that because these identifications are different, they depend on lambda very, uh, in, a, in a very particular way. Uh, this defines uh, some, the, the, the white head moves that we find here, define different mapping class group actions on the same uh, phase space, in the same cotangent bundle, yeah, over teich Muller space. And this leads, just to finish, so uh, I would like to understand, so what's the importance of these different actions of the mapping class group? Uh, you know, for quantization of, of, of this. So, in principle, you could quantize uh, cotangent bundle over teich Muller space quite easily, but does the, the imposition of different types of action, or different actions of the mapping class group on this space, say something about quantization? So, that's it, I think. Yes, yes, they, they are exactly the same as the mapping class group, uh, the white head moves uh, we had before, just with this complex coordinates. They are exactly. Also, we also have this, this quite explicitly, yes. Not so much. So basically, um, yeah, not, not so much. It, the, the complication comes from the, from the combinatorics of this, of this uh, Vial Peterson Poisson structure, but this is just first neighbor. Uh, combination, so P, basically P alpha, or more, more precisely, Y alpha is equal to P beta minus P gamma plus P delta minus P epsilon, where we have, yeah, where we have this, this, uh, these labels for the, for the neighboring edges of alpha. And so, so basically, if we substitute things like this, uh, it becomes quite simple. Yes. In the sense that uh, there are eyes appear in front of, of certain p coordinates, or just the linearized part of, so you have some functions. Yeah, you see, you have logarithms of, of exponential of, of, of axis. Yeah? Now we will have um, also uh, exponential of z's. And in terms of p's, if l, for example, is, is squares to 0, you just get the linear part of these functions. So this is quite different. It's, it's really, really quite different. Do you get uh, a sort of transition from lambda to one? Uh, so from positive lambda to negative lambda? Well, 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 
what what is it meant from a from a smooth right yeah right so what happens let me find yeah so what happens here is this is the ads case so basically the the isometric group of ads is now two copies of psl2r and basically what this means is that this this combinations of coordinates x plus y and x minus y become now completely independent they kind of leave uh, only they only see one of this psl2r and and this is really what what happens for in, in, in this lambda equal lambda squares equal to one? Uh, so basically, one corresponds to this side of the story, and the other corresponds to the other side of the story. So they, they are completely independent pictures. Yeah, it's not. It's not. But but it's true. It's true, and it's true because of the imaginary part of. Yeah, Yes, yes, indeed. But it's, what's impressive is that this combinatorics is the same uh, in all three cases and also is the same as Teich-Muller space. Uh, this is what I think is more. Yeah, so so, I, I, so what what I think people understand uh, this uh, Fox Shekhov paper, they understand the the quantization in this in this setting here. So, but on the other hand, the other setting is just a cotangent bundle uh, in, in some cotangent bundle over some linear subspace. So, it should be very easy to quantize. So, the idea would be, can we quantize in both ways and compare them and understand what's the difference? That is there a difference? Um, uh, so I, I really don't know. I, I really don't have much intuition there. Right. Uh, actually, it's it's. Ah. Okay. So the. Right, so the, 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 this complex analytic structure that exists in, in, in all three cases also. Um, so should I find some? Right, so there's a complex analytic description that, that appears in all three cases and is related to uh, well, diff different maps um, that you get from the cotangent bundle over Teich Muller space to certain uh, representation varieties again. I mean, they are, they are these maps essentially, but they are different. But one way of, of understanding this in the case of complex structures, which is essentially the same as the, the Sitter case, uh, you f out of a cotangent vector here, so a holomorphic quadratic differential, you solve a, a Schwarzian differential equation to obtain a complex structure uh, on the sphere. Yeah? So uh, a complex projective structure, so atlas, atlases of, of, of shards with values in the, in the Riemann sphere. You can also consider a, a different type of map here, which takes a quadratic differential and solves um, in two different ways uh, for harmonic maps with prescribed Hopf differentials. And this is, this is more or less the, the analogous of the Schwartz and derivative in the ADS case. And in the, in the, in the flat case, there is, so this, this requires a bit more uh, thinking, but there is also a relation between quadratic differentials and uh, measured foliations, uh, which is very well understood. And these measured foliations are uh, dual to uh, some real tree. And this real tree is sort of the, the singularity structure of the flat uh, Minkowski space. Or, 
And so so there, there, are, there are, in the three cases, there, there is this, this complex analytic interpretation. This is what I'm trying to do. Uh, some some as aspect of what, what I'm trying to do with Jean Marc Linker right now. Yes. So, so what are these classes specifically? Uh, is one thing of them as, as asymptotic states in the Asymptotic states. No, so so it's really is it's really that the, the your geometric structure shoots out to infinity. Yeah, so you, you really have uh, this cusp is really a point at infinity. But uh, it, it, it goes to infinity in such a way that uh, that you know the geodesic around here really shrinks to this point. I mean, another type of of, of boundary would be a real boundary with with some some so finite length. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, but I, I don't think you can consider them as particles in, in the end. You can also consider conical singularities, and then this, this would have maybe more interpretation as particles, but I, I don't know if... No. Conformally, no. Yeah, so, so basically the, 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 the point is that in, in, the, in the, the universal covering, a, a, Conical singularity would be something like this. You cut the, the disk and glue them like this. Yeah, so with a point inside the, the, the disk. But now this, uh, these cusps, they are also something similar, but the point is at infinity. Right? They are really at far away. So f all, all this talk here, everything is classical, right? Uh, and we are basically uh, describing a very kind of very rigid structure, I think, uh, in the in the three D case. That would be desirable, but I don't I don't know if the, this technology allows you to do that. I mean, so I, I this this I really don't. But I think this would be, in the end, desirable. So I think there are people trying to understand this, this uh, uh, TQFT type picture for Teichmuller theory. But I don't see how it's, it relates to quantization of this, uh, this vector space as described here. 